Tonight we want to look at the life of the Apostle Paul. Praise the Lord. Yes. Let him enjoy the expression. And uh, we want to look at the life of the Apostle Paul. He wrote the major portion of the New Testament. And I believe if anyone is called to the ministry, and even those who are not called to the ministry, but in the ministry in some way, it would do us good to study especially the life of Jesus and his ministry, his method, and his pattern, as well as the pattern of Paul and how he moved about in his ministry. In Paul's life, we could outline it into five major phases of ministry. When God called every person, there is a phase in the ministry that we go through. I remember when the Lord appeared to Kenneth Hagin in the first vision he records, in I believe in vision, how after about 15 years or so in the ministry, the Lord appeared to him and said that he was about to enter the first phase of his ministry. See, God divides our ministry and our call and our vocation of work into different phases. God has it real in our lives. And we need to understand how each phase flow. Because if we could do the right thing but in a wrong phase, we would still be in disobedience. And we have to obey God and understand where we are in the phases of our ministry. Everyone has a phase which God has pre predetermined in our lives. Let's look in our Bibles, in the book of Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, and uh, we see in Galatians chapter 1, Paul making a statement about God's call over his life in verse 15. It says here, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confirm his flesh and blood. The main part is verse 15 that we want to consider. Paul says that even while he was in his mother's womb, there was a definite call that God has placed on his life. Sounds very much like Jeremiah the prophet. When God calls us, it was it sometimes even before we knew him. And somehow all through his life, as a child, as a teenager, and as an adult, Paul sends that divine destiny that seems to draw his entire life in a certain direction. Even when he was an adult, not having the knowledge of God, or the revelation of God, he sought to please God in his own way. Before he was born again had a, and had a special encounter that we read about in Acts 9, Paul really wanted to serve God. And by a wonderful turn of events, he was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, trained under one of the best Bible scholars you could find in, in Jewish traditions in those days. And as he grew up, there was something in Paul that drove him into the divine destiny. And somehow he had a drawing to God. If you hear people who are called, you will... I'm sure you remember how Hagin sometimes said uh, how he, the preach was always in him, even when he was a young boy. And the preach is always there, that draws a divine destiny. And Paul, even though he has not known God yet, had that preach in him. Except he has not known God yet. He was brought up in a religious realm. And we know the famous story which you can pick off from that. How he was one of the top persecutors of Christians. Why did he do it? He tells us in the book of Acts, 
Look at that. Book of Acts. And it gives us a clue as to his motivation. Sometimes when we look at the Apostle Paul in the early days of his life, some of us, if some Christians had met Paul, or if there was an actual Paul around today, excuse me, Paul, I'm not talking about you, likened to the Apostle Paul, and he was Saul before he was Paul. If he was around persecuting Christians, a lot of Christians would be praying Elijah's famous prayer. Lord, send fire, but not in the right way to annoy him. Burn him up. Judge him, O oh Lord. And we sometimes see people on the outside, we don't see their heart. Somehow, inside Paul's heart, he thought he was serving God. Although he looked like a cruel person on the outside, inside, while he was doing all those things you read about in Acts 9, persecuting Christians, putting them in prison, killing some of them, and he was there when Stephen was stoned. In his heart, he reveals to us in his testimony in Acts chapter 22, verse 3, he says, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in, the, in this city, that is Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our Father's law, and was, notice, zealous toward God as you all are. He says, I, I was zealous for God. Now, that gives us a clue. When he was doing all those things, chasing the Christians, looking out for them, taking them and putting them in prison, getting letters from the Sanhedrin Council to persecute them, he thought he was serving God. The pit was in him, but the pit was pit wrongly. He was serving the devil without realizing him. See, in his mind, in his thinking, he viewed Christians as fanatics, and an extreme group that was destroying what he thought the right religion, Judaism. And so he did everything he can to destroy those Christians, thinking that that was what God wanted to do to That was his heart. So when God manifested in his life, both which we could believe was the result of Stephen's prayer, as well as because of his heart. God saw in his heart the blindness, the unbelief that was there. And so God manifested to Paul in a famous story in Acts 9 and changed him over. See, it's not like what some people think that he had malice in his heart. Some people are right in their heart but wrong in their methods. God sees that. Now that's inexcusable too. And, and you will pay the consequences of that. And yet God to people's prayers like Stephen could deal and come and intervene in a course of events. I do not believe that the supernatural signs and wonders or manifestation is a result of accident. I believe God is an orderly God. Whenever God moves, there has been a systematic application of prayer and intercession. And so there was this intercession that has gone before. Every time the Christians are persecuted, they turn to God in prayer. Praise the Lord. Lord, sit in there. And I'm going to stand over here. And uh, as God manifested to Paul, remember this. Whether Paul was serving the devil or he was serving God or serving his own idea or serving his own tradition, it's one thing that you could begin to see. This is even before he entered the first phase. Paul did whatever came into his hand with all his heart. If he lived for Judaism, he lived it right to the end. If he lived for Jesus, he lived it right to the end. Paul says, and we will not turn to that to save time. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul says, 
he ex ex he excelled above all his contemporaries in knowledge and in achievement. See, some people think that the ministry belongs to, especially here in Asia, if any of you have gone to ministry, you realize that if you have been brought up in a typical Asian home, your parents want you to go to university, and uh, it was very popular about 20 years ago, and your parents want you to be a doctor. And so, that's, they are always their ambition for you. And so, when God calls to you, one of the first things you hear is, why, what, sir, why go and work in the church? Try all these universities and these courses and these studies, and when you fail, then go there. I don't know what impression they had of the church. They thought that the only people who serve God are those who cannot make it in life. And I sometimes meet people who are out there and they are trying very hard to get a job. And they fail. Sometimes they get a job, they can't keep a job. Due to perhaps to their own personal problems, laziness, indiscipline. And finally, when they have exhausted all their efforts, they say, God, uh, I'm called of God now. No, they, they, they can't get a job outside. They, they want a job. They, they want to serve God now. See, if we are not successful in the natural, I doubt you will be successful in the kingdom of God. Because the same discipline that it requires in the natural to succeed, it's required except that you apply the same discipline in a spiritual way. Lazy Christians had the worst of both worlds. Everybody likes the best of both worlds. In the world, they find it very hard to succeed. Now they are born again and they are in the kingdom of God and they want to succeed and they still find it difficult. But now it's worse. Because their conscience has been removed. And the misery has been amplified. They have an amplified version of the conscience. <laughs> so they really feel that misery. That's not what God wants. If God called you, and you know God has called you, and God confirmed that tonight, I want you to know that it does not mean that, you know, you could say, hey, you know, my, my business is... Uh, it goes down and uh, I'm uh, bankrupt and uh, I'm this. Uh, 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 God did all these things to me so that I will come and serve Him. So God is not going to make you a bankrupt in order to come and serve Him. God will bless you so successfully, like Job. Then He says, Come, come and serve me. See, God doesn't do all those things to us to make us serve Him. And a lot of people think that just because they cannot succeed, I, I think I perceive that God has a call on my life. And you sit down with them and say, why? Uh, well, every time I try to go into the secular world, I cannot succeed. Therefore, God has called me. <laughs> it's not true. If God has called you, the elements of success will always be there in the natural world too. You will have a zeal that is there. Whatever, like Paul. The reason why Paul could ex excel is because he put his heart into whatever God did. If he was a Jew, he was a top Jew. If, was, if he was a dog, he was a top dog. <laughs> whatever, he wanted to be the top. That's what God wanted. And finally, God met him. And that was the result. In Acts 9. Perfect sermon illustration. Thank you, Father. Acts chapter 9. Please turn to Acts chapter 9. We give him a new name when he gets out of them. Paul, the apostle. Now, Acts 9. Acts chapter 9. No, I don't know why the Father is doing that. 
is the Lord. Acts 9. As Paul was coming to persecute a Christian, in Acts 9, in verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, praise the Lord. Saul, Saul. Right. Not him, right? The rest is not for him, right? Okay. Why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goal. And that was when Paul met the Lord Jesus right on the spot. He came to be born again, he accepted the Lord, got to acknowledge him as Lord, and uh, he also received his call and his commission. In his testimony, in the book of Acts, chapter 23, you cross reference to that. Acts 23, 22. Just me, Acts 22. He says, This Jesus who appeared to him said, in verse 10, when he says, What shall I do? We are given more information here. What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise, go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of the, that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into the Damascus. In Acts 26, he tells us a few other details that God spoke to him while he was lying down, right? Lord says in verse 15 and 16, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He said, Rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. And I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles, to whom, now notice that, notice clearly, God gave him a clue what his ministry was. To whom I now send you. In other words, he was commissioning Paul to the Gentiles. So I will deliver you from the Jews and from the, from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. So bless God, Paul had a call on his life. And many people, when they heard God's call, they thought the call was to go. Never. He's, when he calls you, he always says, come. Three years later, the disciples were given the word, go! And so some people, when they receive a call from God, they don't know the word come and the word go. You can't differentiate. Lord says, come, they go that way. And when the Lord says, go, by that time they don't know go. They say, yes, Lord. And when God calls us, it doesn't mean it's time to quit our job. But a lot of people think that God called me, quit the job, and there they are, unemployed, God's kingdom. When God calls us, it's to prepare ourselves. Right where we are. Whatever way, whatever it takes. So Paul received a call, and the preach came out of him. And like all young people, or if God calls you, excuse me, if you're elderly and God, God speaks and calls you. In Acts 9, one of the things the people do when God calls them is they want to minister. Bless God, where is the, the pulpit, Lord? God, where's the country you send me to, Lord? Where's my church, Lord? Where is my crystal cathedral? <laughs> Poor Robert Schuller, get disturbed by us all throughout this convention. <laughs> I'm holding his Bible. <laughs> in the book of Acts, chapter 9, when he had hands laid on him by Ananias, you with the Holy Ghost, it says in verse 20, 
Immediately, I tell you, he was a born preacher. He had a preach in him. He wanted to preach. And um, immediately, he preached the Christ in a synagogue. That he is the Son of God. And everybody was amazed. And he preached about Jesus from all his experience. All that he had experienced God from his vast knowledge. He preached Christ and he preached Christ and there were no amen. Everybody stared at him. Right. Let's look in. And the more he preached, the more they stared. Now, if that ever happens to you, you have to examine God's call in your life. <laughs> He reached a point when they slowly their fear changed to a grunt. Paul is wondering, thank you for that amen. That was no amen. They were about to bite him. And they were determined to kill him in verse 23. He didn't last many days. His ministry lasted a few days. After many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. When the plot was known, they took hold of Paul, put him in a basket, and slowly let him down. God's men of power for the hour going down in a basket. He went down in a little basket. What's wrong? Because when God calls, he hasn't even entered the first phase. It's preparation. Don't forget Jesus had 30 years preparation. And in three years, he finished everything he wanted. Now he's opposite with a three years Bible training and he had to finish it in 30 years. And Paul tried to go into the ministry. It was not God's time. He was not supposed to do that. No, when God ever called you, you cannot give more than your personal walk with God. When He calls to you, He first to come. Draw aside. While you're working eight hours a day, take all the other steps that you can to spend with God and His Word. Begin to draw near to Him. Don't go yet. Draw near to Him. We are witness of the living Jesus. Unless we know Him, we cannot impart Him. Then He goes again, and although in verse 25 and 26, if you read the book of Acts, how He came over in verse 26 to Jerusalem, it looks like immediately when He got out of the basket, He took the next train, right, or next donkey ride to Jerusalem. He did not. Bible scholars have tried to fit Paul's life, those three years of the death of Arabia and Damascus, they tried to fit it together, and there are several places that they could fit it in. They could fit it, and what portion are we talking about? Galatians, please, in chapter 1. You notice in verse 16 and 17, we read part of the verse just now. It says in verse 16 and 17, after God revealed himself to Paul, says, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remain with him 15 days. Now notice he says in verse 17, I did not go up to Jerusalem. Then in verse 18, after three years, then only I met them. So scholars have tried to piece all these, uh, place these pieces of uh, information together. And they realize that somewhere in Acts chapter 9 is those three years he talked about. And so they have positioned those three years either between verse 25 and verse 26. You can trace every biblical book you can and they have placed it right there. So it looks like there's a continuation but there's a break. Paul went aside to Arabia and Damascus, and after three years, he had three silent years. 
And even after the three years when he has to sit together, recoup, recuperate, and place all that God has been showing him together, yet it was still not time yet. We think in terms of money, but God thinks in terms of years. I like what has been said so far in this convention. We are not here for the 300 yard red uh, deck. We are much right here, so the 100 meter deck. <laughs> we are here on a marathon race. The long haul. And so Paul, after the three years, in verse, looking at uh, verse 26, he finally came to Jerusalem. He says, I did not go to see them, but after three years, I came to see them. When he was in Jerusalem, even the three years had passed, when Paul showed up in town, everybody was still afraid of him. Paul was in town. I could imagine Paul going up to a believer, say, showing up in the church. Praise God, brother. <laughs> Where's everybody going? The whole church was empty. Everywhere he go, they ran. He was wrong. I'm born again. Spirit filled. Tongue talking. Bible carrying. Hand laying. Holy Ghost fire baptized. <laughs> what, what's wrong with everybody? Where are they? It took one guy. His name was Barnabas in the book of Acts. Today his name is called Peter. It took one Barnabas in the Bible and that Barnabas took him and he was brave. had a chat with Paul, found out the truth and introduced Paul to the apostles. And Paul had fellowship with them. From then onwards, he had taught Paul, who had said, Praise God, right hand of fellowship. Ministry recognized. Bless God, I am recognized now. The preach was still coming out. So he quickly grabbed whatever he can and he started ministering and preaching in verse 28, 29. He was with them in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem coming in and going out, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. Something is wrong here. See, if ever you have a call of God and a gift of God, we realize that your gift will make room for you. You don't have to bribe you don't have to push. You don't have to tear down doors. I hear some people teach, you know, if the door is closed, tear it down. I don't know from what Bible school they graduate. <laughs> no, if the door is closed, go to another place. Don't tear it down. Even Paul, the apostle in the book of Colossians, asked them to pray for an open door. He didn't say tear down the door. Because it may be the wrong door. So somehow, even though he had that call, and he was called to be an apostle, there were no open doors. Apostle of what? Nothing yet. Somehow he was, he couldn't make, break away in his ministry. Struggling. Everywhere he go, people wanted to kill him. In the end, the apostles made a decision. Let's send Paul back to his hometown. Tarsus was his hometown. You find that in verse 30. Balik Kampong Paul. Who wants to Balik Kampong? <laughs> Paul says, go back home. And for the next seven years, we never hear of him again. In fact, for the next six years, approximately, all together, plus the three years, would have been nine years. Paul had the preach in him, but the preach, which was a little pitch, 
was not right yet. Still stubborn. God was waiting and waiting. And during those years, Paul must have studied, read, prayed, studied, read, prayed. And I reckon he never tried to knock down any more door. And any door he tried to knock down, they want to knock him down too. He waited on God. See, if you don't learn to... One of the first lessons God teaches you is wait. Wait. Say, God, God, when, when is the right? Wait. God, I'm ready now. I have just got my certificate, my diploma, my degree, my master's, my PhD. Lord, I'm ready. God looks over at Gabriel and says, Could you please tell him to wait? Gabriel comes down. Blows the trumpet. Wait. Nine years. Here comes the first phase. It was a very short, quick first phase. It started in the heart of Barnabas. In Acts 11, you see a Paul. See, the historical record tells us from the book of Acts chapter 9 to the book of Acts 11, it's a period of about 9 years. By Acts 13, it was about 10 years. So we roughly know the chronological period. Acts 9 was about AD 35. Acts 13 was about AD 45. If you minus the one year period when they were in Antioch, you bring it to Acts 11, which would be about 9 years in Paul's land. So in the nine silent years, in Acts 11, there was Barnabas in verse 22. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, and of faith. Tell you, he, he was a faith man. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Then verse 25 is a beautiful word. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. He looked so timid, so quiet. You would have thought that the Apostle Paul who had seen the glory of God, fell flat on his on the ground. Such a dramatic conversion and call that the rest of his life, there was also a lot of drama. But no, some of the greatest things in the spirit come so naturally. The beginning of his first phase came because Barnabas, whom he had befriended, remembered him. You never know who you come to know and you fellowship with. Some of you in this convention meet some people for the first time. But you never know how your life becomes tied up and destiny together. Never underestimate or despise the day of small things. That small little acquaintance that Paul made with Barnabas so insecure, so, so obscure and insignificant became the very key to his first phase. And what was his first phase about? His first phase is what Dan, uh, Daniel Burke is preaching about a first mentor. Discipline and obedience. You learn to work with people. You learn to make friends. You learn to submit. You learn to sit under authority. You learn obedience. In the first phase of his life, he learned how to work with Barnabas. Barnabas went all the way to Paul's kampung. I don't know what Paul was doing. Maybe he was sleeping. <laughs> Meditating on his special presence of God. There came a knock on the door. Paul opens the door. I'm Barnabas, long time no see. 
Manabas began to share with oh, Paul there's this great work in Antioch and uh, I need a hand. And uh, I, need, I need you to come along and help me. Paul says, well, um, uh, let me pray about that. Yes, all right, that's all right, Paul. Pray about that and, and, and come along. And I sense God told me to bring you along. Come along, come along. And just such a small, insignificant event of a friendship, somebody calling another to help him. You never know the ways of God. But that was the most important event of Paul's life. That one man, Barnabas, was an important key. And through Barnabas, Paul's ministry began. For the first time, he was able to teach and teach. And that's in Acts 11, verse 26. When he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year, they assembled the church, and they taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So Paul started just teaching the word, just giving some Bible studies here and there. Some people are called to be prophets, apostles, evangelists, and they want to start straight away. I believe God called me to minister to the 10,000. Now, start with the two and three. You're faithful with the two and three. So he just started ministering, teaching the word to two and three, teaching to the church there, working along with Barnabas, and learning to work with other leaders. He said, is that important? It's vitally important. If you have a gift without a relationship, you will not be accepted. No matter how fantastic you are as a prophet, as an evangelist, if you do not know how to relate to people, all doors will close. They may hear you once. After that, they don't want you anymore. One of the reasons why Joseph aggravated and antagonized his brothers was because he was already giving them an evil report. He was giving an evil report about them. Always telling bad about them in the book of Genesis chapter 37. And this strain in the relationship was there. And then he comes to them and says, Bless God, I had this dream. And he was already having a bad relationship with them. And here he comes and says, God gave me this dream. And in that dream, all of you bow down to me. No wonder they wanted to kill him. And he was partly responsible for that. Of course, to tiny things. Say the key must flow with relationship. The first phase is God dealing with your ability to work with others. Use your authority to flow with what is there and it's not an easy thing. See, many people don't even get past their first phase. Now I talk to ministers sometimes they sit in my office and they're coming out and some of them have gone to three, four churches and they failed and they couldn't get along. Every time they have a problem, they run. They have a problem, they run. They have a problem, they run. And then I got to sit down with them and I say, Hey, if you're not going to do something about learning how to relate to people, this, this will go on for 40 years. <laughs> and 49. <laughs> going to go on. And you may die without reaching that area. And until they change, everywhere they go is the same story. Same main actor. But different, different uh, other background as, and actors. But they're always the main actor and the same scene always comes out. But each time, different places, different time, Different people accept them. And they never get over it. And God will continue to deal with their lives. First faith. I believe what Paul was faithful. You could see in Acts 13 verse 1 how faithful they were. They were able to work together as a team. In Acts 13 verse 1, the church, there was an Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Minion, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and pastor, the Holy Spirit said, 
Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I call them. Finally, after that one short year, first phase, God spoke and said, Now it's time for Paul and Barnabas to enter the work that I call them to. Second phase. By Acts 13, Paul was much ready. And by that time, he had formed such a relationship with Barnabas that they are going to launch into this missionary journey together. The beginning of his apostolic ministry. So Acts 13 tells us the beginning of Paul's second phase. In his second phase, he began to learn how to operate the, new, the things of God, God has placed in his heart. And you notice some of the things that happen at the, in the second phase. In Acts 13, in verse 5, When they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Then you go on from there in verse 14, When they departed from Perga, they came to enter into Syria and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they sat down. And then Paul began to teach and to preach the word of God again. But verse 42, look at the result. First, the second phase here. When the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And the next Sabbath, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul. And verse 44, in the next Sabbath, the whole city came together to hear God's word. Tell you, when it's God's timing, you don't even have to advertise. God who moves. Now, don't, don't mistake me. I, I believe in doing the best we can in the next Sabbath. But there is a balance. There is a balance. Sometimes we rely so much on modern methods of advertisement and mass media that we forget to go down on our knees in God. Here, even before the mass media had got to, got to them, there was no radio, no TV, printing press has not been invented. The whole city gathered together and Paul ministered the word. But something happened in the second thing. Verse 45. The Jews saw the multitude. They were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. I tell you, when Paul said, We turn to the Gentiles, God the Father was smiling. Jesus Christ the Son was praising and worshiping and rejoicing. And the Holy Spirit was so clean. I can imagine Jesus standing to Gabriel and said, he finally got it. See, God had called Paul to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He found in Galatians 2, he found in Acts 9, uh, Acts 26, and, and God spoke to him to the Gentiles. And you have others that if God didn't call you to do certain things, you have no grace to do it. There are three areas of grace. One is salvation grace, which we all know. The other is mercy grace. See, in Galatians chapter 2, look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be peerless, 2 verse 9, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the second time. The grace of God given to him, and he's referring to verse 8, the apostleship. So he had the grace of God to be an apostle. The third area of grace is what I call operational grace. How God wants to work in our, in our life and his choice, but he will work. We cannot, you know, say, God, you must speak to me in this way. You must speak to me in this way. You cannot, because God is God. We are his instrument. 
He gives the order, we take the order. For us to hear him, it's after God how he wants to operate. We just have to be faithful. Paul had received grace for the Gentiles. Nothing mentioned about the Jews. Peter in Galatians 2, very clear in verse 8, he was the one who had the apostleship to the Jews. Even though there had some measure of persecution, there was a certain grace there. So when you read about the persecution that came after Stephen died in Acts 8, you notice a particular word that says, the apostles remained in Jerusalem. In spite of everything, the turmoil that was going on against the Christians, the apostles remained there. In case you miss that word, Acts 8, look at Acts 8, verse 6. In spite of the turmoil, the persecution that was happening, verse 1, at that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, ex the apostles. Because the apostles had the grace of God. You could have the grace of God and God call you to Russia, and you will be protected. You could have the grace of God and God call you to one of the worst countries. The grace will bring you through. Paul will say, it's the grace of God. By the grace of God, he was what he was. See, Paul did not have the grace towards the Jews as he had towards the Gentiles. And so in Acts chapter 13, when he finally has concluded, he's like some of us new in the ministry. As you're launching out, you're still trying to find your place in the ministry. Where is the place that God has placed you in? Your second thing. You've been faithful. And I'll go establish you. You have some, some sort of control or authority in your own ministry. And there you are, you're finding your place in the ministry that God has placed you. If somehow you succeed and you're launched for, the Holy Spirit has said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas. Perhaps in a different way. Separate me, Tanakao and Tanata. <laughs> you know? For the ministry that I have for them. Oh, you launch out, you started your own church, you started your own ministry, you started your own evangelistic or association, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, you launch out with great zest for God. And if you're going forth, somehow you seem to knock your head on some areas. And some areas are wide open. And I like what John Osteen spoke to David Ingle, uh, that David Ingle shared in one of his uh, cassette tapes. When he met John Austin and it was very English to compose a song, you know, I found an oasis of love. A beautiful song that was a theme song in the Wood Church. And very English to remember all his life what John Austin shared with him. He says, David, go where you have favor. In a sense, we could rephrase it in a in the way that we're understanding tonight. Go where the grace of God with you and on you. We're not talking about pleasing men, but we're talking about when God is on your life and working in your life, the grace of God will be there. If God did not call you into those areas, no matter how hard you try, no amount of physical, mental effort can replace the gift of God and the grace of God. You will die. You cannot survive. So when Paul finally in Acts 13 says in verse 46, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. I tell you when you say, we turn to the Gentiles. The thunder roll, the lightning flash, the angels sang, the trumpet blew. Finally, we have done it. Tell you, Gabriel was smiling. Gabriel turned to Michael and said, that's it. Any Paul who have heard it, God will be saying, come on boy, that's it. <laughs> Little soldier boy has finally got it. So there he goes. And do you notice in his first, uh, in his first missionary journey, which is his second phase, that all the persecution he received was from the Jews, they stir up the persecution in verse 15, in Acts 14. There they were again, 
They stir up the persecution. God did a wonderful miracle. And in Acts chapter 14 verse 19, the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, having persuaded the multitude, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day, he departed with, the, with Barnabas to Derby. In his second phase, he received one of the experiences that none of us here, I presume, have ever gone through. Being stoned. Some believe that he's in this time and he received some of his experiences from God, but we can't prove that. We do know, in the midst of all this suffering that he had, somehow they made it with the grace of God, in spite of all the persecution and opposition. And notice their conclusion at the end of the second phase. That's what we want to focus on in verse 27 when we got back. When they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. That was the right conclusion. God has sent the apostles to the Gentiles and not to the Jews. That was where the blessing of God was. So in his second phase, he learned his position in the ministry. His position in the ministry. In his first phase, he has to put himself under another ministry. In his second phase, he began to find his position and place. God's blessing was there. See, all of us will go to different phases. It took me nearly about seven years in the ministry before I found out what God actually wanted me to do. The indications of it were there all the time, but it was a long time to find out. Partly, I believe because I was not watching and looking at where the grace of God was moving in my life. Why? Because every time we enter the ministry, we enter with preset ideas. Concept that is given to us sometimes not from him, but from man or from tradition. And it takes us a long time to get rid of all those wrong things. And it's in the second phase that Paul began to discover and streamline what God has placed. And what exactly took place in the second phase? See, first of all, he discovered that it is, it is God's grace for him to go to the Gentiles. There's a tremendous conclusion in that. Secondly, it established their apostleship. What God called him to do, he was established in. So, in your second phase, when God begins to speak to your life, if you are an evangelist, you begin to be established as an evangelist. You begin to see the results. If you are called to be a prophet, you'll be established. If you are called to be a pastor, you'll be established in that area. There will be some results. There is a difference between human effort and spirit work. Say, what's the difference? Results. No, no amount of human effort will get the result that only God's Spirit can bring. Acts 15, the ending, begins his third phase. It was a painful and a difficult phase. There's a time and place when a change takes place in the ministry. In Acts 15, in verse 36, some days, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now notice here, Paul, although he knew the supernatural, he didn't depend on the, uh, on the supernatural spectacular things. We realize that the supernatural can be quite natural sometimes. Well, let's differentiate between the, the spectacular and the natural looking supernatural. Speaking in tongues sounds very natural, but it's supernatural. It may not be that spectacular. And here Paul didn't look for the spectacular. In Acts chapter 13, when he began his second phase, it was spectacular. As they were all praying together in uh, Antioch, as a team together, God spoke, Separate me, Paul and Barnabas. 
for the work which I called them to. Somehow, in a second phase, there was no voice that he heard. All he had was that desire, the desire and that pull and that drawing to go and visit his brethren. So when a desire was in his life, he followed along with that desire and uh, something happened between him and Barnabas, which is sad. And uh, in verse 39 to 40, the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus and Paul to Silas and departed, being commanded by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went to Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. There was a parting of ways. That was difficult to take. And as you look at it, we realize it could be naturally caused. But even if it was not naturally caused, we could look at it positively and realize that there is a time come, that, that a time can come when you no longer can have those things that you had before. Those relationships or those uh, kind of old buddy ways of working together. And I'm not sure whether any of you have gone through the third kind of phase. Where at a third phase, it does not happen. It's, it does not happen as a it does not have to happen as a quarrel or contention. Although here in Paul's life it began that way. But I believe part of it, part of it was that they were supposed to end the teamwork and they were supposed to go on to different areas of teamwork. We know later on in Second Timothy that uh, Paul had a good relationship again with Mark. So we know with Barnabas he must be restored. But there comes a time at the third phase and the third phase that you may be going through, some of us may be going through that, is when there has to be certain structural changes. In the first place, God don't talk about structure yet. God just wants to establish your gift in your life. But at the third phase, God wants to deal with the structure. Structural changes begin to come. If you study the work and the revival in the book of Acts, and I see they just had revival. I mean, multitudes came, multitudes, multitudes. Oh, there were 3,000 saved. At 5, the number grew to 5,000. At 6, they need a structural change. See, at the beginning, they were just a blessing of God. There was just an outpouring, the gift of God coming. And a lot of people haven't entered the first phase. Some entered the first phase. And there they are starting to work with another, but some are too impatient. So before God finish the first phase, they phase out themselves. <laughs> and some enter the second phase, where God begins to establish their gifts. I mean, they could work alone. They could be the main leader with others behind them. And God establish their gift. Their gift is established. And remember, if your gift is established, there is still another three phases to go. At the third phase, God will begin to deal with you about structure. How you set up your organization, how you set up your ministry, how you team it up together, how you put the people together. See, many times when God pour out the revival in, uh, in East Malaysia, we have so far had about three periods of revival on the east side. The first period, which I met some of the group there, when God touched an entire group, villages, etc., and I met some of them in the seminary, tremendous revival. People just came to know the Lord, visitations from the Lord. Uh, they didn't manage to tap on. Then came a second phase of revival. Then came a third phase, which is among the Sarawa, in, in Sarawa. Whole villages turned to the Lord. And I noticed something. Whenever God begins to move, there are gifts that are established at the second phase. But many times, very few of those moves of God to pass that third phase and that third phase. Because people do not know how to tap on to the move of God and flow on. And what happens is sometimes, as has been spoken, that when the generation that knew the Lord died, the next generation couldn't continue. It will be all again like the book of Judges. That every time when a man of God dies, the next generation went off track. 
And so many times they found her of a moment used by God, anointed, appointed, and chosen. And every time the chosen has gone, the frozen came. And my generation don't know the experience of God. Notice in Acts 16 very clearly, Paul began to learn to team up with people. First he teamed up with Silas. But do you notice he was still looking somehow? In Acts 16, the first place, among the first places he visited, he saw this person named Timothy. Timothy was a successful pastor, well spoken of. And in Acts 16, when Paul saw him, Paul says, Come with me. See, God doesn't want you to go out until you have success where you are planted. Which is why we need to understand that before you can go and minister in Judea and in Samaria, you must be faithful in your Jerusalem, wherever it is. Sometimes people have not been successful in their own places, in their own towns, in their own cities, in their own countries. What they want to do is go to another and just, you know, every time if you go to another country, you get warm reception. But then, if the gift is not there and your place, the opportunity is, you have nothing to do. So in the third place, Paul has to deal with relationships and he, and he learns. Do you notice that it was one of the most important decisions he ever made? And, and many ministries learn how to establish their own gifts, but they never learn to impart it to the next generation. How many great churches or great moves or great work of God, whenever that man of God dies, the whole move dies with that man of God. There's no continuity. We praise God for the continuity that we see in the case of Elijah, Elisha. The continuity that we see in Moses to Joshua. The continuity that we see from David to Solomon. What happened after Solomon? Solomon did not know how to impart to the next generation. And so whatever God has done, that's what died with him. Even in the natural. How many of you want to build up resources? And God bless you, your multi-millionaire. And your children spend it all and destroy themselves. None of us want it in the natural. How much more our Father God? Oh, some of the things that have taken God and his angels. So much work working through the lives of people, building up the next generation that takes over that don't know the Lord, destroy the whole thing. The same thing we realize in this third phase that Paul begins to, to take upon himself people to nurture him. And a lot of men of God will rather keep on the second phase and move to the third phase. They are selfish, insecure, and afraid to pass on the anointing. Something almost like the Chinese Kung Fu Mod Master. They got 10 tricks to teach. So they teach their disciples 9 tricks. Why? Because if he teach 10, then the disciples will be like him. So he teach 9, so that he got 1 up his sleeve in case his disciples try to be funny. But there's a problem there, because then his disciples will teach the next disciples 7 tricks. And you go down the line until the 10th disciple has 1 trick. And he teach his next disciples half a trick. That should never happen. God wants us to be able to learn, like David, unselfish. And David was very disappointed, I could tell you, when God says, you're not supposed to be that house. I could sense his disappointment in a natural at first. But then... David came before God and he humbled himself. Say, God, who am I? I'm just a shepherd boy. And David did one of the most generous things ever. He kept all his wealth and everything. If you read the book of Chronicles, he made ready the gold, the silver, the bronze. He even prepared the nails. He even had the plan, the blueprint. The Bible tells us in Chronicles, he had the blueprint, the pattern that he saw from the Lord. David had the technology to be there, but it was not God's will. The only thing holding David back 
was the will of God. And that's the third phase. We need to understand where our limits are. If you have ever had people work together with you in a ministry, you will notice this. That when they are new with you, you could have a group that are highly effective. But the highly effective sometimes tend to take too much on themselves. Then the other group that are ineffective, they always need you to be there. And uh, they are half as effective. I'm talking about the highly effective one. The highly effective one can have a problem. They poke their nose into everything. After some time, they think they can do it better than you. And they did not learn the limit of their anointing. Sometimes like Korah, they reach a point. Or like Aaron and Miriam, reach a point and say, Who is Moses? We can too. Moses can do it, so can we. What difference is that? They reach a certain point. But yet, but yet, our call in that third phase is to be able to impart to those who are faithful and to effectively pass it on. Only takes a spark to get a fire going. And that's the third phase. And I say that a lot of ministries are so busy on the second phase that they have no intention, no plan, no goal, no vision for the next generation. But we must be different in our generation. We must impart and prepare the next. The Pauls must get the Timothy. And in Acts 16, in this third phase, while he's busy about these new things, about this new teamwork that God has given to him, you notice that Paul always followed a pattern wherever he went. In Acts 16, God broadened his ministry. If you read in his second missionary journey, he goes to a bigger area. He goes to a new area, Philippi, after the Macedonian call. And then in uh, Acts 17, verse 1, in verse 2, as they continue onwards, When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them for three Sabbath reason with them. Do you notice in verse 2 it says, As his custom was? It did not say the law asked him to do it. And it's these same Jews that are going to cause him problems later. Paul kept the pattern of ministering continually to the Jews. And in verse 10, because of the persecution of the Jews, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and they continued to minister in the synagogue from place to place, wherever Paul went. Acts 18, he still went on to the synagogue. In uh, verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia. Paul was constrained by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. They opposed him. And look at what Paul says in verse 6. He says, When they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own head. I am clean. Notice what he said. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. When he said that, the angels sang. I could imagine Gabriel turning to Michael and smiling. First Paul stayed true to what God has called him to do. To go to the Gentiles. Now he should have done that all the time. But it took him that long. And he, for, he sort of left track of what God originally had called him to. And so in the second phase, God was dealing in his life in that area. And later in Acts chapter 18, he returned back, finished his third phase. 
He got all his teamwork, he got Timothy, etc. And you see how important Timothy was. Because in his third place, every time he was persecuted, he had to leave Timothy behind. In fact, immediately after Thessalonica, he left Silas and Timothy, and he went on to Korea, waited for them. And so Timothy and Silas began to play a big role in Paul's life. They began to continue the ministry where he himself could not. It was a different phase altogether. Now the fourth phase was Paul's biggest. That is in Acts 19. In Acts 19, Paul stayed true to what God called him to do. He went directly to the Gentiles. And he didn't go to the synagogue. He rented the school of one Tyrannus. In his fourth phase, things came. When he traveled and he can stay, you know, in Corinthians a year and six months and uh, some places shorter, now in the fourth phase, he stayed at Ephesus exactly three years, approximately three years. And while he was there for three years, he stayed there teaching and preaching the word daily in the school of one Tyrannus, not in the synagogue, but in the school of Tyrannus. And that was the biggest and the widest extent of the ministry Paul reached physically. Because of that, the whole of Asia Minor heard the gospel to Paul's ministry of three years in Ephesus. That was the largest phase that he had ever extended physically, that is. When he reached his fifth phase, which was the hardest. In his fifth phase, in Acts chapter 20, as he was going to leave the elders in Miletus, the Bible tells us that Paul told them he will not see them again. And Paul says that he has to go to Jerusalem because somehow the pool of the Spirit was going there. In Acts 21, while he was in Philip's house, Agabus the prophet came and prophesied about what would happen to Paul when he was in Jerusalem. And Paul knew some of the things that were going to happen. But some of Paul's closest friends, Luke and Silas and some of the others, tried to persuade Paul from going to Jerusalem. But Paul said he was willing to go even to die because Paul was going to enter his fifth phase. Now the fifth phase is the hardest to understand while Paul was alive. Because in his fifth phase, he was taken and placed into prison. And for all those years, he was always on trial, always continually on trial. But it's in his prison and in his trials, right up to Acts 28, when he went to Rome, that Paul's biggest ministry took place. We, because of his prison, we have his writings today. And Paul's ministry reached to thousands today because of his chief faith. We know his famous prison episode. We know the letters he wrote from prison. And so the free faith was the hardest to understand because in the natural, he looked like a failure. Just like Jesus, in the natural, he looks like a failure. But in Paul's free faith, he was the biggest ever. All the writings in the scripture that we have today, a great number of the letters result from his free faith. Because God tells us in his faith, in the fourth phase, Paul became stationary. In his free faith, we are just jumping along because time is catching on us. And in his free faith, he turned to letter writing. And what we want to emphasize at this point is this. Be sensitive to God's phases in your life. Some people will look at people like R. Roberts today and think that he has gone off the chain ministry out of the will of God when he built his ministry. It's not. Understand the phases of God. If he had not done it, he may be disobedient. I don't adjudge the message for all these things. Some people criticize. Not everything may be done that we may be agreeable to. But we must have this understanding. A lot of those people in the 1950s got called. A lot of those evangelists and Bible ministers got raised in the 50s revival. And they are still around today. 
is because they were sensitive to the different phases of their ministry. Some of those who were not sensitive have died long ago. And they are no more living to continue the impartation to this generation today. But those who have been faithful to the phases that they were in, continue. You see, it's not that if God called you to a certain ministry, all the rest of your life you're always doing the same thing. All Robert's special gift was in his hand. He always had to lay hands. Long lines to come. Now he seldom do that today. And there was a change from ten ministry into a different type of ministry in his time. The same with Kenneth Hagin when God called him. In certain places, he had those hands burning. And then later it changed into discerning of spirit. So God has a call. And since this is a, a minister's convention, I'm talking about the ministry. Because different one of us, that's God's word to us, different one of us are in different ministries and different places. We must recognize our different office and call and be faithful to it. Or we must understand which faith we are in. Because if we do not know which faith we are in and where we are moving in, we will miss what God wants us to do within that faith. And if we fail to do what God tells us within that faith, you never get promoted to the next faith. You will either remain there and die there without entering some of the other faces that God has planned for you. And some of the hardest things for us to accept in ministry is this. When there is a change in faith, there can be a change in the message you bring forth there can be a change in the method you bring forth and there can be change in the ministry that you carry. Total change. That's one of the hardest things because we human beings are locked to one method all the time. And when there's a change in faith, we must flow along. Be prepared to go along with that. And even today when I realize God ministry and call even in, in my life I'm preparing for different phases at different times realizing that there is no, no such thing as eternity on any place of this earth we have a short time to do what God calls us to do and in each place in each country in each town each city that God has called you to God will teach you and show you what you are to do in each phase and God has for your life. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, I realize that we have not exactly gone into the kind of teaching that we would love to, O oh God. O oh God, we pray that you would continue to speak in our hearts and in our lives, O oh Lord. That message, O oh Lord, that you are placing in my heart unto the people. O oh God, that which you are calling for different ministries, that which you are calling for different ministers, O oh God, for the call that you have on your life, for the giftings that you have in your life, O oh God. We know, O oh God, that there are changes that are coming about in His life, in His ministry. And we ask, O oh God, that there is a spirit that is placed in our life, that you began to call us to, O oh God. That, that we could flow in the same spirit in that level of anointing you call us to. But, O oh God, that you would cause us to be faithful, Lord. To be faithful to each faith that you call us to that we will not be disobedient to the heavenly vision, to that which you call us to. We know, oh God, your ministry and your grace continues in our lives. We are so God. And for those who stand in the fivefold here, and for those who we have called but may not have moved in into the fivefold, that tonight you cause the sensitivity to the faces of change in ministry. And sometimes it calls for change in method, sometimes in message, sometimes in ministry. And you cause us to be obedient, O oh God, to flow along with it. Father, we ask that you establish your grace in your mercy. We ask that you establish your grace in your life, in each heart and in each mind. Even tonight, in Jesus' name. Would you stand very quietly with me tonight? And as you sing that song very softly, you're standing on holy ground tonight. 
we are standing on holy ground. Tonight we are focused more on the ministry of the Spirit and of the Word. I believe God wants to fulfill that which is called to. We are standing on holy ground, and I know that. But tonight, we're not speaking to each one of us specifically who are ready. Established in some way in the ministry. But we are calling for those of you who are, especially in the Asian region, God has called you to the fivefold ministry in Asia. There is a stirring that is coming up in Asia. God is raising up fivefold ministry. Something likened to the fivefold ministry in the decade of the 50s in the healing revival. In hundreds and thousands of ministries just burst forth. Something is happening that is burning forth in Asia. But unless, and unless we learn from the mistakes of the past, the same kind of errors and mistakes are going to happen. And God wants to prevent that from happening. And if tonight God has called you to minister in an area in Asia, you could be an established ministry. You stand in one of the five folds. And you know that in this conference, especially God has by His destiny brought you here. So I'm not speaking to everyone who is in the fivefold, but some who are in the fivefold. And you came here with the expectation to receive an impartation. Tonight, and I want to, I want, and I want to invite all those guest uh, speakers in this convention to also minister together in this. There are some changes in your faces that are taking place even in your churches in your respective areas and ministry and tonight God wants to minister to your life and cause an impartation to take place so that the giftings of God and His place in your life can go forth so you know your call in one of those areas or several the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher you know that your call especially in the Asian region we want you tonight come right up just stand on the second line there and I want to invite those guest speakers in this convention to pray in impartation for the Asian fivefold ministries that are coming forth